Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Fergus Ewing on an update on the work of the National Council of Rural Advisors. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so if anybody wishes to ask a question, please press your request to speak buttons now. And I call on Fergus Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In January last year, this Parliament agreed to establish uh, an independent group involving relevant stakeholders to provide advice as to the principles and policies that should underpin options for appropriate rural support beyond 2020. A National Council of Rural Advisors was duly established with 14 individual members drawn from a variety of backgrounds and appointed on the basis of their expertise in operating and supporting rural enterprise. It was important to me that we appointed as many women as men. Their voices and experiences are often wrongly absent from rural policy debate. And also that a number of younger people were involved. That approach was embodied in the appointment of co-chairs in Alison Milne and Lorne Creerer. The National Council was asked to provide advice for government on the implications of Brexit for rural Scotland as well as recommendations on future rural policy and support. The paper produced last November largely confirmed what we knew, that the implications will be far-reaching and extremely challenging, particularly through the loss of people and skills, and that continued membership of the single market and customs union is the least damaging Brexit outcome. That finding is reinforced in the discussion paper published uh, on Tuesday uh, I agree wholeheartedly with the National Council's conclusion that Brexit weighs heavily on the future of our industries. But the paper also makes clear that rural Scotland is capable of building uh, on its inherent resilience and creativity to overcome such barriers and challenges. As the National Council puts it, with the right focus and energy, we can achieve a new rural econ economic strategy which puts people at its heart. One of the core strengths of the Council's approach has been this willingness through 11 Rural Thinks workshops held around Scotland and also engagement with stakeholder organisations to listen closely to others. That process, backed by the evidence, suggests that there are strong and resolute foundations upon which to drive forward Scotland's rural economy. Research produced by the Scottish Government to better understand the rural economy shows that the strongest economic growth in Scotland between 2007 and 2015 was not in urban areas, but in what is termed mainly rural areas, with strong growth in the value of goods and services also in island and remote rural areas. The National Council challenges us to produce a better way of measuring economic growth in rural areas and it's a challenge that I readily accept. The National Council's call for a defined and ambitious strategy for Scotland's rural economy that develops natural and human capital, competitiveness, robust infrastructure and social inclusion is compelling. Its discussion paper identifies three key, three key themes for that strategy, vision, people and infrastructure. The vision on which a strategy is based must accentuate the many positives and strengths in the rural economy, as well as acknowledge the barriers and address the challenges. I particularly welcome the focus on inclusive growth and tackling inequalities in the rural labour market and creating quality job opportunities. This is key to attracting people to move or return to live and work in rural Scotland and to developing the talents of those who live and work there currently. Through the, Scot the current Scottish Government campaign, Scotland is now, we will continue to do all we can to make clear that Scotland is a positive and inclusive country. And, for example, that migrant workers are welcome to make their lives here and contribute to our rural economy. Rural Scotland needs people to stay on the land and in our remote communities in order to thrive. As the National Council have uncovered, the best people to lead rural Scotland are the people who live there already. Which is why this government is already investing in their skills and talents. We core fund Scotland's Rural College, UHI, and all its associated colleges, the University of Glasgow's Crichton campus in Dumfries, and the University of West of Scotland's campus in Ayr, as well as providing rural campuses with 
a £9 million rural premium. The 21 regional action groups for developing the young workforce cover all of rural Scotland. We have introduced a rural supplement to training providers delivering modern apprenticeships in remote and rural areas and we have funded almost 1,400 modern apprenticeship new starts in land-based frameworks over the past three years. The third theme of infrastructure also matters, or as one Rural Thinks participant puts it, multi-level connectivity. This government is already working hard to create the physical infrastructure Scotland's rural economy needs. We are making the biggest public sector investment of any government in the UK in broadband, providing £600 million to deliver access to superfast broadband to 100% of homes and businesses by the end of 2021. The Reaching 100 programme prioritises the most remote and rural areas of Scotland that currently uh, have the least access to broadband connectivity. We are building over 50,000 new homes with £25 million specifically dedicated to housing in rural and island communities. And just this weekend, we committed to creating a further 3,000 homes through the Building Scotland Fund. We are creating Scotland's first dual electric highway on the A9. The Aberdeen Bypass will be completed later this year. We will undertake a feasibility study into improvements to the A75. And we continue to provide support to Highlands and Islands airports and lifeline ferry services. Through the food processing and marketing contracts since 2015, grants have been made to invest in the supply chain infrastructure for rural businesses, like the £4.5 million grant uh, announced in a visit I made last week for ABP to develop further its facilities in Perth. And we are investing in communities' own capacity, transferring assets to local communities from the National Forest Estate, including the three projects just announced yesterday investing in fisheries local action groups in coastal communities, seeking to support more women into farming through the Women in Agriculture Task Force, as well as providing over £71 million to Highlands and Islands Enterprise to provide economic development support and establish a new enterprise agency for the south of Scotland. But I also accept the need to ensure that rural areas enjoy the same opportunities and access to services as urban areas and that we need more streamlined and cohesive support mechanisms to better help businesses. Signing off, sir, what we support in the rural economy in the future and how we do that must reflect government's aspirations and objectives, but also must be informed by real evidence of what the public values as the agriculture champion state, or as one recent Rural Thinks participant put it, that policy is driven by people. So I can announce that the National Council's work will continue over the summer with a consultation on nine key questions arising from these key themes in the discussion paper. That consultation, opened on Tuesday, marks the start of the rural civic conversation that the agriculture champions called for. The National Council will use the information gathered alongside evidence already collected to refine its recommendations and I anticipate its work being complete in the autumn. The National Council and its 14 members have already made a significant contribution to our discourse on the future needs and interests of Scotland's rural economy. I have found them to be insightful and willing to challenge, questioning the status quo and generating fresh ideas. Uh, and I must thank them all for what they have achieved to date and for their enormous effort and contribution to that task. Supporting their work to continue over summer will allow them to complete their deliberations and produce comprehensive recommendations to help create the vibrant, sustainable and inclusive rural economy that we all wish to see. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to our questions, starting with Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for sight of his statement. I'd also like to refer members to my register of interest. I'd like to welcome the work of the National Council of Rural Advisors who have identified many of the challenges that rural Scotland already recognises. Now, many Highlanders and indeed the Cabinet Secretary, I'm sure, will take huge issue with this report where it suggests on page 16 that Urquhart Castle is in the Kyle of Loch Alch. I think we both know it's not. But this is a report that has no hint of a strategy or a policy 
which the Cabinet Secretary suggested only last week there would be. So I have to ask how long it will take to get one. Well, there's going to be a six-week consultation, probably followed by a six-week period to analyse the responses, and then probably six weeks for the Cabinet Secretary to consider that analysis, and if we're generous to the Cabinet Secretary, at least another 16 weeks to come up with a policy. That's 18 and a, eight and a half months in total from today to draft a rural strategy. So we probably won't have any ideas from this government until February 2019. Frankly, Cabinet Secretary, that's too long. So I'm going to ask the Cabinet Secretary, when will we have a plan? When will you stop delivering, uh, dithering and start to deliver a plan for our farmers and the rural economy? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I'm pleased, I guess, that Mr Mountain welcomed the work that the uh, National Council have done, although that was kind of really the end of any positive content of his remarks. Uh, I would have thought that it behoved uh, the Scottish Conservative Party to recognise that these are 14 individuals with, with uh, uh, no political perspective, but rather the viewpoint and uh, uh, and perspective of those who have contributed enormously to the rural economy in Scotland and whose efforts should therefore be appreciated. I would also point out that, uh, this, that uh, the NCRA uh, is a group that I was asked, indeed instructed, to appoint by this parliament. And therefore it seems to me to be churlish to say that we should preempt the work that parliament has asked us to do uh, by ignoring their work and their recommendations, which will be forthcoming in the autumn. I can assure the member that, of course, we shall respond to that final report when we receive it, as well as to the report of the agricultural champions, which, uh, we, we, which we have uh, last week. But uh, I do think that it's, uh, it, it is really rather negative that Mr Mountain completely ignores the offering that is produced in this excellent discussion paper from people who some of whom are actually here today listening to this just bear that in mind an excellent paper uh, with the slogan together we can and together we will that's a positive slogan uh, and perhaps that's why the Scottish Tories aren't keen on it since the three main activities that they appear to be interested in are nitpicking gnat bashing and power grabbing Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement and to thank the National Council of Rural Advisors for the work they've done on what is a, a very positive uh, uh, and important report. For those of us who represent and live in rural areas, the questions the report asks, however, will be very familiar. They also reflect, I have to say, a disappointing progress that has been in building strong, sustainable rural communities over the past decade, even without mm -hmm. the challenges we face of Brexit. The Cabinet Secretary says he's particularly welcoming of the focus mm -hmm. on inclusive growth. But the reality mm -hmm. is we've had not one, but two government economic strategies that gave commitments to regional equity, but have failed to deliver that equity with low pay, for example, still rife across rural Scotland. The report also highlights the digital divide where the rollout of fibre broadband in recent years left and still leaves many rural communities behind. There's also emissions in the report and the Cabinet Secretary's response today. There's no mention, for example, of the utter scandal of rural poverty and there isn't enough emphasis on the value of our natural environment. Tackling poverty and protecting the environment must be key principles at the heart of agriculture and rural support post-Brexit. So I ask again, can the Cabinet Secretary give us an exact timetable when this government will set out a shared vision of what Scotland wants that post-CAP support to look like and take that case to the UK government Government, instead of waiting for the UK government to tell us what to think. In other words, once again, when will the Scottish government stop waiting and start leading when it comes to supporting our rural communities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that Colin Smith acknowledges the, the good work that the advisors have done, and I think that's, that, that is genuine and welcome. Um, I, I, uh, if, in respect to the timescale, I confirm what I've already made clear that the final report from the NCRA will be available in the autumn. That will be considered by us, and then we will respond to it in detail, along with the work of the champions. And bear in mind, this is a consultation document. I mean, we want to hear what the public have to say. If you read this document, it says repeatedly, well, there's lots of heckling as usual, and sort of negativity coming from that direction as per the norm. But, but you see, on the positive side, what people have said in the, 
the 127 people that took part in the 11, 11 rural things, meetings throughout Scotland, a huge commitment to work, incidentally, by these, by these people. You would thought it would be welcome. They've said that they want policy to be made uh, listening to people. We're going to listen to the people and then make the policy, not devise policy without doing that, particularly since Parliament has asked us uh, to do that. I don't accept the, the premise that, that, uh, uh, premises of the assertions that uh, Mr. Smith has making. We are doing considerable amount of work, as I said to the REC committee just, I think, last week, in order to prepare uh, policy making in the future. Uh, and of course, that's a very serious task. But until such time as we know what the budget will be, what the tariffs will be, what the costs will be, uh, it is impossible for anyone who is to produce a plan with figures and clarity. Uh, but uh, I, I can assure all members that we are dealing with all of these matters on a daily basis, uh, uh, and uh, I, I hope to say more about that relatively soon. Thank you. Emma Harper to be followed by Peter Chapman. Thank you, President Officer. Can I remind Chamber I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. I welcome this report and its central recommendation to create a rural economic strategy and agree absolutely that people living and working in rural Scotland need to be involved in policy making. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how the civic conversation being launched with this consultation will ensure that women's voices and the views of young people are heard and listened to? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think that, that is an important uh, part of the response. We are very keen that we should hear from, uh, from uh, females, uh, in particular in rural Scotland, and young people, uh, and young females. And of course, Emma Harper is aware of the Women in Agriculture Task Force, uh, which I co-chair with Joyce Campbell, and which is addressing specifically uh, some of the gender inequality issues, uh, which I, I think, as this report, as this discussion document highlights, are, are actually quite extreme in parts of rural Scotland. The disparity between the average female and median male earnings are, I think, particularly stark in some parts of rural Scotland. Uh, we will, of course, throughout the, the process of the consultation, wish to encourage people throughout rural Scotland to respond to it, to submit their views. I hope that they will, I expect they will, and we want to see what they've got to say and study that carefully and take that into account when we move forward. Peter Chapman to be followed by Graham Day. I thank you, Presiding Officer, and I declare an interest as a partner in an agricultural business. Well, here we are, a whole year after the Council was formed, and this is all we have. A document with no answers, only questions. Frankly, this is very disappointing. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned just a few seconds ago that he has no, no, no idea about budgets. Let me say that, tell him categorically that in the DEFRA document, Health and Harmony, it states categorically that funding for Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 farm support will be delivered at the same rate until at least 2022. So I ask again, when is the Cabinet Secretary going to give any positive ideas for a rural economy and start to deliver a plan for a farmer's future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I must, I'm afraid, correct uh, Mr Chapman. It's not correct to say that the Scottish Government had received assurances that uh, uh, Pillar 2 payments uh, beyond those contracts that have been entered into uh, prior to Brexit Day will be honoured. Uh, no such commitment has been made, as Mr Chapman should know. So his assertion that that is the case is, in fact, incorrect. And it follows, therefore, that the conclusions he draws from that are also sadly wrong. Secondly, and I think perhaps more importantly, because we've gone over all this ground ad infinitum, endless hours of parliamentary proceedings, gone over the same old negative moaning and whining from the Conservatives. But what's more important and what's really disappointing is Mr Chapman's assertion that there's, there's nothing positive in this report and either he hasn't read it or he's unwilling to hear what it says. Uh, I mean, there's a whole series of recommendations about how rural Scotland goes forward. The emphasis, though, is on looking at the successful ventures that uh, are created by business in rural Scotland, to look at the positives, to look at the opportunities, to see how we can help people achieve even more by addressing the three strands, the vision, the people, and the infrastructure. And I set out in my opening statement, of course, many, many ways in which the Scottish Government is doing that. 
uh, and I'm not going to repeat them now, you'll be pleased to hear, presiding officer. But of course, uh, this is an excellent positive report, and I'm really quite shocked to hear Mr. Chapman's incorrect uh, and quite insulting characterization of it. Graham Deed to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you. If anything demonstrates the damaging impacts of Brexit that the report has highlighted, it's the issue of migrant workers being able to continue to contribute to our rural businesses and wider economy. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the Tories have an utter brass neck to be carping about the time being taken to deliver the rural strategy when they've had two years, two years, since the Brexit vote to address worries over access to seasonal workers, and they have done nothing? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, 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 uh, I do, and the National Council of Rural Advisers uh, it confirmed that migrant workers make an enormous positive contribution to this country. Uh, and uh, from visits that uh, I have made, and Mr Day obviously represents Angus, Angus uh, uh, Growers, uh, I spoke to many of the migrant workers, and I can say that many of them were genuinely concerned about whether or not they would be welcome here. I, I think that's a quite appalling predicament to put people in. I think it's unsavoury. And of course, we didn't vote for this in Scotland anyway, yeah. did we? No. no. Uh, uh, and I would point out again, in conclusion, well, they're laughing at this. I don't think it's very funny. Uh, but I would point out once again that Mr. Gove, Mr. Gove undertook, when he spoke to the NFU uh, south of the border earlier this year, that uh, he would come forward. There would be a scheme and he announced that it would be brought forward relatively quickly thereafter. It hasn't. I've asked him about that at the meetings, uh, and I'm afraid his scheme has not come forward. So rather than berate us uh, for something which is not a devolved responsibility, why don't they join with us in saying this parliament should have the power to deal with these matters, because plainly the UK government has got no appetite or intent to do so. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary alluded to the gender pay gap before, but if I can just quote from the report, it says, women living in remote rural Scotland have the lowest annual income of any group and the largest median gender pay gap at £5,076 when comparing annual median wages. This means that remote, in, in remote rural Scotland, women earn 17% less on average than men. Presiding officer, I believe this is down in, in part to seasonal, part-time and low-paid work and also falling public sector employment. The Cabinet, sec no, the Cabinet Secretary says he is committed to tackling inequalities. Perhaps he would like to tell us what action he is going to take to tackle the gender pay gap. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, that was indeed the section of the NCRA report to which I was alluding earlier, so I'm pleased that Rhoda Grant has identified it. Uh, I think actually it's, it's useful that we've, we've had the benefit of this report in order that we can uh, see that uh, these are the, the situations that we need to address. There are many, many things that we need to do to address pay inequality. This government is doing a great many of them because they cover a whole range of issues about childcare, about employment, about access to opportunities and training, about transport. But we are, I think, and it's fair to say, committed across the, uh, the whole of the government uh, responsibilities to do what we can to tackle uh, those matters in a fairer way and do our very best to reduce that inequality gap over time. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Mike Grumman. Thank you. Can I welcome this report as a starting point in this conversation, although currently there are more holes in it than a block of Swiss cheese. There are no mentions of the environment, which underpins our rural economy, no mentions of the future of the SRDP, and no mention of issues that affect people in rural areas such as access to childcare. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary that in spite of the uncertainty we've seen over Brexit, the Welsh Assembly has produced a vision for rural support post-Brexit. When are we going to see the Scottish Government's vision for rural support for the SRDP post-Brexit? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I, I think it's a bit unfair to, to, to say that the, the work of the NCRA doesn't recognise these things. I'm aware that, that they do, and of course, if you look at their interim recommendations last November, you will find that, uh, uh, that I think they have done so in many respects. Um, but of course, I welcome the contribution uh, from the member and his party to this consultation. I hope that there is a good response to that. I, I can assure you uh, that uh, the NCRA are absolutely committed to the twin imperatives of uh, 
the, of agriculture in terms of producing food and looking after tending the landscape and doing so in an environmentally friendly fashion. And that's an extremely important element of uh, the approach the Scottish Government has taken and will continue to do. Uh, I have made clear repeatedly that my vision for the rural economy uh, is to use our natural assets to best advantage uh, uh, and uh, to, as far as farming is concerned, to ensure the primacy of producing high quality food in a way that is sympathetic to our landscape uh, and to use our people, the best resource of all. I've made that clear on countless occasions uh, and I will continue to do so. But what I'm particularly pleased about in conclusion today, presiding officer, is that the NCRA have come up with uh, a vision that's entirely aligned, I think, with that which we have already set out. Mike Rumbles to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. It's the question of vision, Cabinet Secretary. Can you tell us what your vision is for the future of Scottish agricultural financial support post-Brexit without referring to the UK government criticising them? We can all do that. But what is your vision for the future? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've already set out in response to Mr Ruskell uh, uh, an abbreviated version of the vision that I see for for rural Scotland, and I will continue to do so. Uh, and I want to see the financial support for rural Scotland continuing to be provided at the level that we were promised it during Brexit by all the Brexiteers, which is currently 500 million. And I also want to see paid back to Scotland the 160 million pounds that was intended for Scottish farmers that was siphoned off by UK treasuries under Conservative leadership uh, with a bit of help, actually, from the Liberals, Mr. Rumbles, as I recall, uh, Mr. Alexander's uh, term in the Treasury. Uh, and that money's been siphoned off by the Tories with uh, a bit of help from the Liberals. I want that money back for the Scottish rural community. It was intended for them. And now we see, and I'll conclude with this, presiding officer, the ridiculous situation that next year, the amount per hectare in financial support for Scotland will be at the lowest level of any of the EU countries or states. That's what happens if you allow the Conservatives to run Scotland. Can I just indicate, by the way, there, there are still six more members who wish to ask questions, but less than, well, two minutes left. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Jamie Green. Um, I draw members' attention to my agricultural holding and the fact that I will be an R100 uh, beneficiary. And in that uh, connection, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I wonder if, in looking at the contracts for the R100, preference will be given to those which have future proofing so that when the backhaul is eventually upgraded, we can have 300 megabit and a 1 gigabit delivery to rural locations, thus enabling us to have an advantage over urban areas where presently we have a disadvantage. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Mr. Stevenson does make a, a good point, uh, and the answer is yes, the, the way in which the contract is being taken forward in the procurement stage is to anticipate the future need uh, and desire to move from super fast to ultra fast. Uh, my understanding uh, is that the use of fibre is an enabler of that process to take place, and that therefore forms part of our thinking about uh, whilst we cannot mandate one technology over another because of state aid rules, to encourage and to score the tender in terms of points by reference to the extent to which the achievements are reached by provision of fibre rather than other methodologies, precisely because of the point that Mr. Stevenson makes, that that then empowers rural Scotland, in some cases perhaps to an even greater extent than those uh, urban uh, dwellers in order uh, by having ultra-fast broadband in years to come. Jamie Green. The Cabinet Secretary talks about improving connectivity in Scotland's rural communities, but the reality is a catalogue of failures re uh, recently on the CalMac network has left many island communities far from connected. Uh, CalMac themselves admit there is zero, zero resilience, no additional capacity, and a significant risk of further breakdown this summer. So what does the Cabinet Secretary have to say to those communities who have been so badly let down in recent months? And can he tell the Chamber today what immediate steps have been taken to ensure that ferry services to every island in Scotland will be safeguarded this summer? 
Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I'm not quite sure, presiding officer, what this has got to do with the National Council of Rural Advisors. And it is a little bit insulting that members just choose to ask anything they wish and any topic they wish. Uh, instead of addressing the good work that these individuals have, have done. I think it really is actually quite insulting. Uh, I can't really recall anything quite like it, but there we are, that's the Conservatives for you. To answer his question, of course, we have provided uh, resources to uh, CalMAC in terms of the tender, which have allowed them to expand. We are providing extra vessels. Uh, we have dealt with difficult situations that arose. And of course, part of these difficulties are the problems of success the success of the growing economies in the islands, growing tourism, growing population, RET, leading to more people choosing to use the ferries. These are the problems of success. The Scottish Conservatives wouldn't know much about that. Thank you, and apologies to, there's four members who would wish to get in, but I'm afraid we have run out of time. And I would just use this opportunity to remind members to keep their questions short, ministerial replies equally succinct, and we'll actually get through more questions in the time allocated. However, we'll now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 12730 in the name of Claire Hockey. We'll just take a few moments for the ministers and others to change seats.